How's everyone doing today? It is uh, Sunday, July 12th, um, and we are here with uh, our brand new format of uh, Perspectives with Black Men. Um, I'm excited to bring to you this new format where we do a 30 minute interview with uh, a Black man and talk about their perspectives on uh, different issues as well as just to get to know uh, them um, and learn more about them so that if we want to paint uh, positive images of our black men and we want to hear from um, directly from our voices. So we want to hear directly uh, from black men, uh, our experiences, as well as our solutions to some of our common problems. So uh, today I'm excited to have with uh, us today um, one of my mentees uh, and fraternity brothers, uh, Brandon Harris, um, who is in his last year of his Master's of Public Health program at the University of Memphis. Um, and he's uh, originally from Euclid, Ohio. So um, Brandon, welcome. Welcome and thank you for joining us. If you could turn your camera thank there. You. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me, NJ, thank you. Yeah, no problem. And feel free to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, as you said, I'm from Euclid, Ohio. I have a sister who ended up going to high school well, actually junior high, high school, and college with me. We both went to Kent State. Uh, I finished with a, a bachelor's in public health with a concentration in health education and promotion at Kent State. And then I moved on to the University of Memphis to get my master's degree in public health. While at Kent State, at Kent State I joined Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. As NJ said, he's my fraternity brother. I was a four-time varsity uh, award winner on the track and field team. I, I was a, a McNair scholar, so I conducted research with a faculty mentor. So that program really changed my life and helped me get into my master's program. So it's a big part of who I am. And I had fun, you know, I, I had a lot of fun at Kent. I made a lot of friends and I'm still living. I'm still here, so it's a blessing. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So thank you uh, for uh, sharing a little bit about yourself um, there. And really, you know, when you think about yourself and your childhood and um, who you are, usually our childhood kind of forms who we are. And so and you, if you could describe your childhood in one phrase, um, what would that phrase be and why? In one phrase, I would say a lifelong learning experience. And because of my parents, I would say my parents did a very good job raising both me and my sister. They taught us a lot of lessons, just the little things, the little things about working hard, the little things about taking the time to do it right instead of having to keep going back and doing things. I always uh, laugh because my mother, 
she used to make me recite the phrase or recite the uh, definition of the word self-discipline. And I still have it in brain. Self-discipline is the ability to do what you need to do, when you need to do it. And she always used to emphasize whether you feel like it or not. And so that was her lifelong learning tool that she instilled in me that, you know, to, to be successful, to, to have those things that, you know, that we all want, that self-discipline is a big part of that. And both my parents are still influential in my life now and are still teaching me. So it's been quite the experience. And I'm living home now. I moved back home because of the whole pandemic thing. So now they're in my ear a, a lot more. So just soaking it all in, trying to learn as much as possible. <laughs> I like the way you put that there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes yeah. you, you know we when we when people talk about their parents and um you know they don't necessarily call it soaking it in <laughs> <laughs> that's how I had to I had to phrase it for me you know that's how I had to to think about it so to keep, yeah keep it moving yeah that that's that's pretty cool mm -hmm. all right well, um well thank you for uh describing that so um you know, as you have, what are you, 23 now? 24? 23. Okay, 23. Um, as you have aged and, you know, you, you are at a pretty uh, still formative uh, age in your life. As you, when you think about, um, you know, what gets you up in the morning? What drives you? You know, what would you say? You know, talk to us about what drives you to stay uh, motivated and to, to keep doing what you're doing? A lot of what drives me is intrinsic. Just knowing that through the talents and the gifts and the things that I've been blessed with, that I can use those to, to, keep, to keep going forward, to move ahead in life. Just even getting a track scholarship to run at Kent. And I still coach track down at a school in Memphis. So just still using those the skills that I have to move forward, it's, it's driven me to want more for my life. So even doing well, I did, I finished with a 3.1 GPA at Kent. And because of all the extracurricular things that I did and because of the talents that I used, it allowed me to go get my master's degree paid for. And knowing that I have these abilities and these gifts, it just makes me want to keep using them and, and, and to keep moving in a direction that's positive with these things. So a lot of it is intrinsic, but a lot of it is also extrinsic. My family motivates me. You know, everybody wants to make sure that their parents, you know, that they're taken care of and things like that. But even when I think about my family to come and how I'm gonna provide for them, it makes me want more so they can have more. And even my, uh, the Lord, my relationship with the Lord, he, drives me to, to not be distracted by all these other things and all these things that can take me off the path that he has for me. So just finding ways to remain grounded and to remain humble amidst being blessed with, you know, talents and gifts, but just always trying to move in that positive direction, always trying to find that next thing that I can do that can benefit me in the long run, not in the short term. And that's kind of where I've gotten, and that's kind of what has helped me get to this point. Wow, that's that's pretty uh, awesome. That is that's pretty awesome. So, um, I, you know, as you think about what drives you, uh, I'm sure some of that uh, played a role into why you chose public health as a field to go in, um, and you know, you chose public health before the pandemic happened, right? So mm -hmm. talk to us about why you chose public health as the field to go into. Well, kind of a funny story. I did not choose public health because public health interested me originally. I was working with my guidance counselor when I was at Kent State, and we were having a scheduling conflict between my track practices and class and labs that I was going to have to do as originally a pre-physical therapy major. So in conversation, we came to the conclusion that I may need to switch my major and public health was a good alternative to uh, pre-physical therapy. 
but in learning more about what public health entails and just the overall body of public health and what it does, it's really changed my mind to understand that health is, uh, it's, a, it's a valuable thing. You know, public health in and of itself, uh, wow, I'm getting jumbled. It, it, it encompasses every facet of life. Even when you think about air pollution and our personal choices and advertising on TV, these are all things that can affect health in some, in some way and public health influences these things. And the pandemic in and of itself really just exposed a lot of the areas where there's more need for public health, maybe more policy or maybe more workforce where the demand is. And so it makes it a lot better for me and you know jobs and things like that. So that helps. But Public health is really an amazing field and, and health, just our, us and our bodies, this is our only tool to navigate life with. If you don't have your health, if you don't have your body, it significantly impairs you from navigating life and getting to those things that you want to. So it really made me look at my health differently, the health of the people around me differently, and public health as a field. Oh. Yeah, so um, that's actually pretty pretty good. So, um, I'm you know sometimes when we change our majors, especially in the in the way that you said you changed your major, uh, all about a love that you had for running uh, track, and then you know it kind of like public health chose you and you fell in love with it. Uh, and so as you went off uh, pre-pandemic to graduate school uh, to the University of Memphis to get your MPH uh, in public health, you get hit with a global pandemic, which is I'm sure something you, you were learning about that mm -hmm. might take place at some point. Uh, talk to us about how this pandemic has either strengthened your interests or changed your interests and in what ways. It's definitely strengthened it. Like I said, uh, the pandemic kind of exposed a lot of areas where public health needs more demand. And even with minority populations, we need more representation. And that's one thing that's been, that, we're, that we've been seeing even with the COVID and how it's disproportionately affecting minority populations. A lot of minority populations are essential workers. So they're the ones that are out on the front lines that are more likely to get, uh, to contract COVID-19. So just even things like that, people don't know and people need to understand uh, that we have a voice and that we can use that voice and we can learn about these things that are affecting us. And so one of the things that has strengthened it is my need or my, uh, my want to teach, I guess, to, to help people understand these things, to, to really convey scientific articles and put it in layman's terms for everybody to understand because we have power, there's power in representation, there's power in the people that are, uh, that are fighting for us, but we have to know about these things and we have to, to, to be able to, to have more of an influence on these things if we wanna see change. And the whole Black Lives Matter and the protests are kind of one way to, that we're seeing that change, but even in public health, we need more, more minority people in public health. I saw recently there was a, a handbook that was created to show how rashes look on black skin versus uh, Caucasian skin. And just things like that, when we think about it's, it's 2020 and we're still, we still don't know what a rash looks like differently on uh, darker skin than lighter skin. And when we think about how that effect has trickled down into different systems of how we don't feel represented, we don't feel wanted, we have to start moving in those directions. So this has definitely increased my want to, 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 to let people know and to, to keep moving myself. Wow, yeah, so um, I, I think that's uh, actually something good to think about and to talk about um, just the privilege that um, you know, white people in our, in our society sp specifically have by just being able to go to the doctor and have someone believe that they have the symptoms that they have. 
um, because they can see it easier or it looks the way that they think it should look because that's the way they've been taught. Um, but it looks differently in black people. And so uh, I think that that's a really uh, insightful thing that you said um, there. And thinking through um, just that, um, you know, what issue um, in public health, um, you know, in your field that you really want to tackle that you feel like more people need to know about? Well, the area of my MPH is social and behavior studies. So we're looking more at social interaction, how that affects health, the uh, social circles, even when you think about uh, zip codes and the people that live in certain zip codes and how that affects health. So like even my area of research, I like looking at social determinants of health, the barriers that are keeping people from good health. Again, so looking at those zip codes, people are living in food deserts and areas where there's not as much nutritious food, or some people are living in areas where there aren't any sidewalks, which inhibits physical activity and things like that. So I'm tied between wanting to start looking more at public health policy. So like the laws and even how bike, bike paths and they have signs to let them know that these are biker paths. That's an example of public health policy and things that they're implementing to, I guess, alleviate that. But I'm tied from looking at the policy and social determinants of health. Also looking at, you know, minority populations being a minority. So looking at our kind of health. So those are kind of the areas that interest me and also research, research of these, I guess, topics is what I want to go into is to learn more through research. I can't hear you. I can't. Nope. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. I don't know what happened. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, social term social determinants of health is a big um, field and a phrase um, that's out there that not everyone understands. Um, and I know we didn't talk about uh, this, but I'm just really interested in hearing your perspective as we think through um, the public health um, policies and practices that are happening right now. Um, and with COVID, you have a lot of um, Black people uh, specifically who are disproportionately impacted um, health-wise by uh, COVID. So uh, can you talk about any of your perspectives on that and how social determinants of health uh, plays a role? Well, definitely when we talk about disease and who is it going to affect more it's always going to affect lower income people and how america is built and the systematic i guess economic systems that are in place leave minority populations in those uh low income brackets i guess so when you talk about the disproportionate disease will you know it's going to affect us differently than it's going to affect the affluent so that's part of the problem with COVID. And again, like I said, a lot of minority populations are essential workers. When we talk about people who are working at grocery stores, the fast food restaurants, the, the bus stations, things like that, those are lower income jobs. And by default, lower income people are working those jobs. So we're stuck in that essential, essential uh, uh, worker barrier, which again is, why we're so disproportionately affected. It's a, lot of, it's a lot of other things that go into it. When you talk about even policy, how uh, people are living, you know, minority populations have higher chances of more people to a household, more people uh, living in certain square feet of space just because, you know, of redlining and things like that. And it's a lot of different systems that are that are the reason why we're uh, disproportionately affected. But these are the things that drive my interest in public health and drive my interest to want to understand why these things are like this. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Um, so um, I, I I really have more questions on that, but I'm I'm gonna leave that alone. I think that um, we've 
you know, we've heard some some good things from you as well. Um, before I ask you my last question, uh, I wanted to say to you, those watching, if you have any questions, um, we're going to get them get to them now. Um, and so please put them in the comment section and we'll ask Brandon um, those questions. Uh, but I just have a question for you. When you, you brought up Black Lives Matter earlier, um, so can you talk to me just briefly about, you know, when uh, after George Floyd's murder and you saw the protests and everything, as someone who's 23 years old, uh, going into the field of public health, um, what were some of your thoughts about what you saw with the protests and the way uh, the police and the, the city governments and all that responded? I think definitely I was, I went to, to uh, the protests in downtown Cleveland to see what was going on. And it was just a lot of chaos. You know, the protests were, they were hurting people, you know, we, we were hurting people. You know, you don't want to see the whole world hurting over the death of an un unjust death. And it was just sad to see. And it was sad to see the response by the, uh, the police and everything with the tear gas and the rubber bullets. And, you know, you just want change. You want to see things happen differently for people of color. You want to see things happen differently just in America. You don't want to keep seeing the same things happening in different ways and taking different forms. I saw a video and it was really good at explaining it. He was like, these are the same things that we have been doing since I was born. He said, we need to find a different way to do things. We need to find a different way, you know, to figure things out. And I, I really think that starts with more representation, more, more seats at the table. And, you know, you just want to see change. You don't want to see, you don't want to fear for your life, you know, growing up. I don't want to have to fear being pulled over by the police. I don't want to have to fear for my kids, my, my, uh, my fraternity brothers, my cousins, things like that, my sister, you know, I don't want to have to fear for them. So you just want to keep trying to move and change and move and keep trying to find ways to change this and make it make it better for us, make it more equitable for us to live here, you know, and things like that. So just want to, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, I definitely appreciate uh, you being here and sharing your perspective. Um, the last question that I have uh, for you is, you know, when you're not, you know, not doing your work in class, like what are some of the things you do as hobbies? What do you do for fun to keep your mental health uh, grounded and stabilized? Hobbies, I definitely like to play video games. So I play Call of Duty Warzone. So if anybody, any of y'all play, just DM me so we can, you know, we can get on there. Uh, I run, I definitely like to stay in shape still. Lifting weights is definitely one of my favorite things to do to relieve stress and the, to help me to stay focused more so. Uh, playing my saxophone is definitely one of my favorite things to do in my pastimes. I like listening to uh, some of the songs that I have in my iTunes library and just trying to learn the notes and learn how to play along with those songs. So. That's definitely something I do and kick it with friends and family. My friends are pretty cool. My family's pretty close. So we all hang out all the time and just have fun, you know, enjoy life, enjoy summer, you know, amidst everything that's going on. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you. I, I, I thought you said you, you wanted to show us a little part of your talent. So, um, Maybe you want to share share that with us now. Yeah, uh, maybe I, maybe just a minute. I'm prepared. Just a minute. I'm prepared. Okay. Bye. 
Just a little some some. Right, right. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, the funny thing is, I didn't know you played the saxophone until you moved to Memphis. Like I ne never knew. I play. I started playing saxophone when I was in sixth grade, but at mm. that point, it was just you know playing the in the band that sixth grade. I played in my junior high band, and I ended up playing one year of marching band. But after my freshman year of high school, I put my saxophone down and did not touch it again probably until my senior year of college. Mm. And took what I knew so and took what I learned, you know, my fundamentals and started playing again. Wow. That's pretty cool. Um, and thinking about the, the pandemic and just all the stress, uh, it has to be uh, stress relieving to just play. Um, I've been seeing you post a lot of different videos of you playing or even just pictures of you playing uh, um, on your social media. So, um, you know, music is just, uh, is, a, is a healer as well. So I just wanna thank you for, thank you for that. Um, anybody out there watching, we have about five minutes. If you have any questions, feel free um, to, um, Put them in the chat there if you have any questions. And while we uh, wait for the questions, uh, just one question for you: like, what's next for you? You know, what's what's life uh, in the next five years or so for Brandon Harris? Oof. That's a lot. You know, this pandemic kind of made a lot of things difficult to you know to to think about moving forward, but. Hopefully moving forward from my MPH and applying for a doctoral program in public health with a concentration in social behavior sciences, somewhere that's paid for, Lord willing, and somewhere in a, in a good location for me to settle down. And another thing I wanna do is keep running track. I, I've been training since I finished uh, running an undergrad and I wanna stay in shape and you know look for a potential, I guess, areas there and I want to keep playing my sax. I want to keep growing. I need a teacher to really help me hone my skills, but I want to keep playing, hopefully start making my own music and start blessing other people's, you know, the way the saxophone has blessed me. So a future of what could be. So moving towards that. Right. That's pretty mm -hmm. awesome. So um, just like, like uh, good, good family members would. Uh, your mom said you were excellent and you got it going on. Uh, <laughs> and your, sister, your sister said uh, that was awesome. Keep it going. So uh, and then there's, uh, there's other comments about uh, you doing well. Uh, you, you were doing, you were playing your uh, sax. So uh, you know you definitely have a talent there. Um, I do have one question and then we'll wrap it up is, you know, have you ever thought about mentoring and, and, and yeah, basically that's the question. Have you ever thought about mentoring? I've definitely thought about mentoring. Uh, one thing that I can say is that in having mentors in my life that has really shaped my path for me and helped me realize some of the talents that I didn't know I have. So definitely want to mentor. I actually, I tutor for inner city Memphis high schools through an organization called Peer Power in Memphis while I'm at grad school down there. And I tutor high school students. So that's kind of my, what I feel is moving towards mentoring because I love the kids and I love working with uh, the teachers and the subject matter to help the kids. So I definitely want to move into more of a mentorship kind of role. So 
All right. Thank you very much. Is there anything final that you want to share with those watching today or who might watch later? One thing that a wise woman once told me is you do not have to pay for grad school. So all of my Facebook people out there watching just know that I am not paying for my master's degree and you don't have to either. And if you want to find out more, please contact me and please, you know, please utilize all your resources. Don't just say no because it feels like it's impossible. Always still try to move in until, you know, because something might pop, you know, you never know. Wow. That's my last little caveat. Thank you very much. So <laughs> I just want to thank uh, Brenda Harris uh, for stopping in to the show today. Um, and as everyone, um, I, I shared with everyone uh, the other day that we are uh, moving to this new format. So if you like this format where we have, um, you know, just 30 minute interviews with people um, who are um, on their journey uh, about a topic that they're very passionate about, uh, please join us every Sunday. Um, and we have someone new next Sunday, which is actually my 36th birthday. Um, so it's the, one of the best days in the year. Uh, July 19th um, at 8.30 p.m., we will have my cousin, Dr. Tony Brown, who is a pharmacist. He owns his own pharmacy, one of the uh, only Black pharmac pharmacists uh, or pharmacies uh, where he is in Maryland, outside of D.C., um, and so come check him out, uh, listen more about his pharmacy, number one pharmacy um, there, is, I think it's in Laurel, Maryland. Um, and with that being said, uh, we'll be here on Sunday. We have a great lineup for you. Uh, we'll be posting that lineup pretty soon. And if you know someone who you think, um, some male, black male out there who you think that uh, the world uh, really needs to know their perspective, feel free to um, have them email me at njakbar at icloud.com, or they can just go and message me right there into the Perspectives with Black Men, hosted by NJ Akbar PhD. And with that being said, thank you again, Brandon, for joining us. And for everyone who's watched, uh, thank you for watching as well. And follow me on Instagram at Brandon J. Harris underscore. All right, you heard it. Yeah. yeah. yeah follow him on Instagram. All right. Thank you very much, Brandon. Thank you. <laughs>